All right. Well, here we are with uh, Chapter 39, Abuse and Assault. And we'll start first talking about abuse, uh, more domestic abuse than child or dependent adult or child or elder abuse. Um, intimate partner violence or domestic abuse uh, is a crime. And it's important that we know the local reporting requirements. And in Iowa, there is no option in that. Um, if you are called to the home for somebody that has been assaulted by their domestic partner or intimate partner, then uh, that has to be reported to law enforcement. Um, we know that domestic abuse is a learned pattern of assaultive, controlling behavior, including both physical assaults, sexual assaults, and psychological attacks. Uh, it's also based on uh, economic control. Um, the abuse has obsessive behaviors, uh, or the abuser has obsessive behaviors, and it often escalates over time. Uh, domestic abuse intervention programs uh, have a wheel called the model, model of Behavioral Categories, and we'll take a look at that as well. That's right here. And the center in the center of this wheel or in the center of domestic abuse is the need for power and control and the abuser uh, uh, demands or commands that power and, uh, and control uh, by using things like uh, coercion and threats uh, making and or carrying out threats to do something to hurt the uh, a partner or threatening to leave them, or threatening to commit suicide, or um, threatening to make her drop charges, or make her to do illegal things. Um, they use intimidation by making her afraid of uh, smashing things, destroying her property, abusing pets, displaying weapons. Uh, they also use emotional abuse by putting her down, making her feel bad about herself, calling her names, making her think she's crazy playing mind games, humiliating her, making her feel guilty. They also use isolation uh, to exert this power and control uh, by controlling what she does, who she sees, who she talks to, what she reads, where she goes, limiting her outside involvement, and using jealousy to justify his actions or her actions. Um, they use minimizing, denying, and blaming where they make light of the abuse and not take her concerns about it seriously, or they say the abuse didn't happen, or they shift the responsibility of the beha be abusive behavior, uh, saying that she caused it. Uh, they may use children, if children are in the picture, uh, making her feel guilty about her children, using the children to relay messages, uh, using visitation to harass her, uh, and threatening to take the children away. Um, they may use male privilege, which is treating her like a servant or making all the big decisions and not incorporating her in the decision process, acting like the master of the castle, and uh, being the one to define uh, both uh, the abuser's role as well as the partner's role. And then economic abuse, preventing her from getting or keeping a job, uh, making her ask for money, giving her an allowance, uh, taking her money, uh, not letting her know about or have access to family income. The abuser characteristics. The abuser is typically between 18 and 30 years of age, has, suffers from low self-esteem, uh, witnessed uh, home violence as a child, um, and believe that they're demonstrating discipline. Uh, they do not like being out of control, and they feel there is no other alternative. Um, they have the inability to back down from conflict. Um, they feel powerless to change. They may also, uh, you know, drink heavily, use drugs, uh, may be prone to sudden fits of rage, uh, may be insecure in nature and suffer from jealous tendencies, uh, may be struggling financially. Uh, maybe hard to keep a job, uh, but uh, always after the abuse, um, attempts to be charming and loving and say that it will never happen again. Reasons that uh, the abuser doesn't report it 
certainly is uh, fear for herself or himself, fear for children if they're in the picture. Um, they honestly believe the abuser will change, and behavior modification is just is just something that if you don't, you know, religiously work at it, um, it is extremely difficult to do. Um, the abuser, the abuser, the abusee, the person being abused may have no other means of financial support. They may have no support structure, uh, and they believe the abuse must be endured in order to keep the family together. The different cycles of abuse, and we talked somewhat about these already, uh, psychological, which is, of course, emotional abuse, uh, physical injury, uh, economic or withholding money, uh, neglecting the partner, uh, and sexual abuse. Um, during the cycle of abuse, there's a tension-building phase that leads up to the outburst of anger and the abuse. Uh, there could be some intimidation, some arguing, some verbal and emotional abuse, some isolation tactics, uh, frighten them with looks or actions or gestures that imply they're going to physically hurt them, maybe threaten them. Uh, and the relationship strain is really high with uh, heightened anger, blaming, arguing for uh, things that are occurring in their life. And then the abuse phase uh, may include mind games or humiliation, uh, again, controlling who the victim sees, what she does, uh, using other people to relay messages or spy on uh, her. The abuser threatens self-harm if the victim suggests leaving the relationship. Um, and physical violence, never the first form of abuse, uh, it may escalate to that. You know, long before there's a, a, an actual physical violence, there's uh, a lot of psychological and, and financial and that sort of stuff going on. And the abuser blames the victim for the abuse, and uh, in these relationships, sexual abuse is common as well. Uh, the honeymoon phase occurs after the abuse has happened. The abuser is remorseful, promises never to abuse again, um, makes lots of apologies, those sort of things. So why doesn't the victim leave if they're in an abusive uh, uh, relationship? Um, you know, they may still be in love with the abuser. Um, they may say, well, it doesn't occur very often, and generally the relationship is pretty good. Uh, the victim may believe that she can fix the abuser, um, may hope the abuser changes or stops, and of course hope is a, a really ineffective strategy for anything. Um, they may have strong religious convictions presenting them from uh, marriage dissolution or getting a divorce. Uh, it may be a financial issue. They may lack any social support. They may fear retaliation from the abuser. And they themselves may have shattered self-esteem and, and doesn't believe that, um, you know, if they leave the abuser that they could live independently. Characteristics of an abusive relationship include unrealistic expectations of the relationship, uh, difficulty in expressing anger, uh, clinically depressed, repeated attempts to leave the relationship, suicidal ideations, and the use of excessive alcohol or other substances. The role of the EMS personnel in domestic abuse, uh, first and foremost, is scene safety. These can be uh, probably one of the most um, unsafe scenes that you'll uh, come upon because depending on uh, the state of the abuser, uh, they still could be wanting to lash out, strike, uh, and certainly if they have a weapon, use a weapon on you or themselves. So size up uh, the scene is, is, is essential, making sure that it's safe, um, notify police if they're not present, uh, do not enter uh, a scene of a domestic abuse without law enforcement uh, because there could be weapons and very violent people in the home. Uh, interview the possible abuse victim alone and then if you believe that uh, physical abuse or you know ab abuse of any kind is occurring, uh, make sure that you pass that information off to the emergency department during your report. Um, suspect abuse if injuries do not match the mechanism of injury. Uh, much like with child independent adult abuse, um, you know, if the 
the description of how the injury occurred just doesn't match the type of injury they have, uh, then you should be highly suspective of uh, physical abuse. Now, <clears throat> this has nothing to do with mandatory reporting. Um, domestic abuse is a crime, and it needs to be reported to law enforcement. Um, but this isn't a contact the Department of Human Services, and they get involved sort of thing. Uh, your role would be that if you suspect uh, domestic violence, then you contact law enforcement. Do a detailed physical exam. Uh, females should assess females. Males should assess males. And the most common injuries that they may occur, or that they may have from physical abuse, are going to be, you know, chest, abdomen, genitalia, breast, head, neck, face, and pelvis. Um, accidental injuries to the distal part of the body, and intentional injuries to the proximal part of the body. Signs of injuries or indicators of abuse, uh, multiple calls to the same address, uh, the explanations don't match the injury, uh, there's a lot of elusiveness or hesitancy in describing how the injury occurred, um, the uh, seeking care for the injury is delayed, hours if not days. Um, injuries during pregnancy should be highly suspicious for uh, domestic violence uh, because that uh, that that happens more frequently than you than you might think. Uh, <clears throat> both the abuser and the abusee may um, uh, be using substances, uh, alcohol, drugs, uh, may suffer from emotional disorders, uh, and they may actually come out and say that they're being abused. Uh, pattern injuries, you know, you certainly can look at the body, particularly when we're talking about bruises, bites, human bite marks, those sort of things, and see what caused the uh, injury, what the person was struck with. Um, now, here they're actually measuring the centimeter from uh, canine to canine, uh, and if you, if you measure that and that distance is uh, greater than three millimeters, then uh, that's a human bite. And also remember with dogs, they have much uh, larger, deeper, um, much larger canines. And when they puncture the skin, the puncture wounds are much deeper. And then a dog will shake his head uh, so that the flesh is often torn around the bite. Uh, facial petechiae, something that you might see. This would indicate a near strangulation or suffocation. And here you can see it not only on the, on the uh, neck by the shoulder there, uh, but also on the uh, face. Uh, multiple bruises in various stages of healing, and here the key is the location of the bruises. You know, as you look at this, these certainly would be bruises that could be easily covered up, um, but you, you got to wonder, how did those occur? They're just not in areas where people normally bruise, uh, particularly in women. Uh, you know, those would indicate in this picture, uh, you know, severe blows to the, the, the chest or, or specifically just the breasts. Um, keep in mind, too, that some medications cause bruising. Uh, you know, aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and warfarin and Coumadin. And so bruising could be easy in, in patients who take those kind of medications. But again, the key is location. Where is the location of the bruise? Is it in an area where people normally bruise, where they bump into something? Uh, if it's not in an area, then you should be suspicious for abuse. Uh, the patient may have multiple non-traumatic and chronic complaints. And the most common complaints of uh, a person being abused may be extremely vague. They may include headache, uh, body aches. Uh, some other signs of abuse might be chronic tardiness or absences, uh, chronic medical complaints, again, very vague, uh, inappropriate dress for the climate, uh, you know, if it's really hot, being all covered up so that people can't see the bruises. Um, they may have uh, uncontrolled uh, chronic medical conditions. So if they're diabetic or they're hypertensive or something like that, they may not take very good control of their disease. And so their blood sugars may be way out of whack. They may be hypertensive. And then also there may be some obstetrical and gynecological conditions that might indicate abuse. Uh, if they have HIV or sexually transmitted disease, an unplanned pregnancy, uh, chronic pelvic pain from uh, things like uh, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, frequent vaginal or urinary tract infections, 
uh, miscarriages, multiple abortions, obstetrical complications, delayed prenatal care, and, and low birth weight infants all might be signs of abuse. Um, on your assessment, you certainly may suspect that the abuse has occurred, and it's important that you ask the uh, patient, especially if you believe that they, they are, uh, there's evidence that they've been abused, um, away from the abuser, uh, ask them, uh, but convey these messages that there is no excuse for abuse uh, and that it's not the victim's fault. Uh, only the abuser is responsible for their behavior. Uh, no one deserves to be abused, and uh, there there are support uh, systems, uh, safe houses, all kinds of things available uh, for the person being abused. And again, if the victim tells you that they're being abused, uh, that's something that you should uh, believe because uh, it takes a great deal of courage to make that claim. Show respect, provide empowerment by allowing decision-making, actively listen to what they're saying. If possible, have the same sex EMT do the interview and perform the assessment. Provide referral information for shelter or safe house. Um, and the victim is going to be more receptive to this before the honeymoon phase. Uh, where the abuser is begging for forgiveness and says they'll never do it again, yada, yada. Um, ask questions, but be direct. Uh, interview the patient alone, as we'd mentioned. Uh, absolute privacy before asking the questions. Do not interview the, the, the parents in front of the children. Uh, anyone accompanying the patient is a, a potential abuser. Uh, and if... Um, if the abused person cannot um, or will not talk uh, because the abuser is present, that should be suspect. And if you're not able to ask because of people surrounding, no lack of privacy, that sort of thing, but you do believe that the abuse could be occurring, make sure that you report that to the ED staff. Assess the safety of the situation for the victim. Notify police if you believe it's domestic violence. Do not leave the victim alone with the abuser. Do not confront the abuser. Do not put yourself at risk. Remain calm, respectful, sensitive, non-judgmental with the victim and the abuser. Um, some other uh, unique situations concerning effective communication. Um, Lesbian or gay patients may not report for fear of acknowledging that they're in a lesbian or gay relationship. Uh, so that, that may be a roadblock or stumbling block. Non-English speaking patients, you, of course, use family members. Uh, in this situation, maybe a child uh, that speaks English or <coughs> that's able to communicate information back and forth. Just be careful about what it is you're asking. Um, undocumented immigrants, um, they may be dependent on the abuser, so they have no desire to report that the abuse is, is occurring for fear of being deported, for uh, fear of being pushed out into um, a strange environment where, you know, they have no money, no uh, family support or anything. Um, keep in mind, too, that if the abuser or even the victim suffer from mental health issues, uh, substance abuse issues, you have to question whether they're good historians and whether or not what it is that they're telling you is believable. Now, I say that, that you, you know, you have to question it, um, but, uh, you know, physically looking at them, you'll have an idea that what they're saying is true, and uh, you can report that to law enforcement. As far as um, the equality wheel in a relationship, uh, relationships should uh, include non-threatening behaviors, respect, trust and support, honesty and accountability, responsible parenting, shared responsibility, economic partnership, and negotiation and fairness. And so these are things that uh, certainly come out from the, um, these are spokes of the wheel, that uh, when these things are all um, in place, uh, that that uh, 
healthy relationships uh, flourish. The role of uh, EMS personnel in effective communication also <coughs> remember that if the victim has uh, serious disabilities, they're not likely to um, report either for fear of losing their dependence. And when we're dealing with older older adults, um, you know, that can be domestic violence if it's from a, a family member, um, but it could be dependent adult abuse if it is uh, a dependent adult. Um, victims also fear that, that if I tell somebody that I'm being abused, um, the police might be really hard on them or in jail when they're determined to be there for abuse. They may um, be attacked and that sort of thing. And so the victim may fear the abuser will be mistreated, and that might be another reason for reluctance. Um, gather all the information you can before transport. Uh, document any injuries, a full description of appearance, size, other characteristics. Uh, be very objective of what you've seen, uh, not subjective. Use the patient's exact words, including in quotation marks or patient states. Um, remember not to make remarks that cannot be su substantiated, so that's why we have to remain very objective. Um, you can say that the patient states that she was hit, in several, hit several times uh, about the head and neck, and objectively, you would just have to document any sort of injury you saw uh, about the head and neck. Uh, write legibly, and of course, many people are using electronic uh, medical records or electronic patient care reports, so that may or may not be a big issue. Uh, preserve any physical evidence. Uh, put it in a paper bag, not plastic. Uh, do not allow the patient to bathe, shower, or use the bathroom. Now we're going to move into child abuse and neglect, and you've all are mandatory reporters, and you've all attended the two-hour mandatory reporter training. So you're familiar with most of this. We won't spend a lot of time. We'll just go over it quickly. Um, child abuse occurs certainly uh, when there is more poverty, uh, when there is more alcohol or substance abuse within a household, uh, when there is social isolation, uh, when there's violence in the household, uh, or when the parents suffer from mental illness. Some characteristics of the abuser, uh, they may be indifferent to the child, uh, they, they may seldom look or touch the child during your assessment, they may be very unconcerned about the child's injury or the prognosis, um, may show no signs of guilt or remorse. They may be openly critical of the child um, and, and have no real idea of how the child feels emotionally or physically. They may blame the child for the injury um, or they may uh, appear themselves to be self-centered, preoccupied with, with themselves uh, and may be very immature in behavior. The pre-abuse state, um, they recognize behavior. Uh, attempts can be made for help before the abuse occurs. And that rarely happens where an abuser recognizes that they have a problem and report it before it occurs. But when that does, then they can get that abuser the resources they need to prevent it from happening. Child maltreatment, here they're referring to neglect, and that's the failure to provide basic needs. There can be physical neglect where the child does not have the adequate food, clothing, or shelter. Uh, could be abandonment of the child, uh, inadequate supervision, or uh, kicking them out of the house. Uh, here on the left is a, a baby with a failure to thrive uh, as compared to one uh, on the right that is uh, doing quite well. Um, uh, so you would know the difference when you saw it. Uh, medical neglect is failure to provide appropriate health care. It will result in uh, poor overall health, compounded medical problems, and we often don't include dental <coughs> in this particular discussion, but uh, also um, poor uh, oral hygiene, poor um, you know teeth that may be rotting or blackened or obvious cavities or those sort of things uh, in a child that aren't being attended to. Uh, educational neglect can occur as well, and that's not allowing the child to receive an adequate education, not enrolling them into school, not 
not providing them homeschooling or denying any recommended special education for the child and allowing the child to skip school. Neglect, as far as indicators in a child, they, they may have untreated illness or injury, they may have poor hygiene, diaper rash, uh, lacks needed medical and dental care, lacks sufficient clothing for the weather, poor school attendance, um, maybe prolonged exposure to environmental elements without proper clothing, uh, chronically tired and hungry, maybe malnourished, maybe begging for leftovers or stealing money to buy food. As they get older, uh, you know, may start with uh, some substance abuse, you know, constant demands for attention, state that they're not being cared for, and they may be underdeveloped for their chronological age. Indicators in the caregiver uh, who is neglecting their child, they may be depressed, uh, they may be substance abusers themselves, um, they themselves may have irrational behavior and indifference to the child. Emotional neglect is is hard to um, determine. It's not like you can see it, but just because you see it doesn't mean it isn't occurring. Psychological abuse, which is emotional, uh, occurs when the, uh, the child is made to feel worthless, unwanted, unloved. Uh, the child will suffer from developmental delays, in acquisition of speech, uh, developing their motor skills. Uh, Weight and height level is substantially below normal. Uh, they may have nervous disorders, eating disorders, habit disorders like biting, rocking, head banging. Um, they may suffer from behavioral extremes such as overly complicated or overly demanding. They may be withdrawn or maybe aggressive, maybe listless to excitable. Uh, and they may have uh, age inappropriate behaviors. They may um, revert back to bedwetting or uh, soiling of their pants. Um, and they may uh, exhibit the same sort of behavior towards other children, other adults, or uh, particularly small animals. The caregiver characteristics, uh, much like physical abuse, uh, like a physical abuser, a psychological abuser may show indifference to the child, ignore the child, reject the child, be extremely critical of the child, uh, belittle them, terrorize them, isolate them, encourage them to participate in illegal or antisocial behavior, uh, or expose the child to spousal abuse, or allow substance uh, use or substance abuse. Physical abuse is intentionally inflicting an injury. It results from severe punishment. It may include head injuries, fractures, or abdominal injuries. Now here in both these situations, uh, in the uh, whiter skinned uh, uh, children, you see uh, evidence of abuse uh, on the cheek of the one child and the buttocks of the other where uh, they were uh, beaten by some sort of stick or ruler on the buttocks there, and I'm not sure what that imprint is. But on the top left, that is not abuse, so those, those may look like uh, bruises. Uh, those are called Mongolian spots, and they're normal discoloration in, in skin. And parents, uh, the very first time you examine a child like that, know that they're to tell you those are Mongolian spots and, and uh, not, uh, not bruises. Sexual abuse is uh, inappropriate. Uh, at, Adolescent adult sexual behavior with a child may include touching, may include exploitation by taking of photos, those sort of things. Um, if the child reports an injury to the genitals, you know that uh, sexual abuse is occurring. And uh, some of the indicators, you know, as you see in the picture here, might be uh, a red and swollen perineum, uh, bruising around the genitals, uh, bruising on the inside of the thighs, lacerations, bite marks, cigarette burns, uh, those sort of things. Um, so indicators the abuse is occurring. Uh, they may complain that they're being sexually abused. And again, that's when a child complains of that, that's, that's money in the bank. You need to take that serious. Uh, it just takes a tremendous amount of uh, courage for a child to report that. Um, the child may exhibit seductive behavior. The child may uh, ask other children to undress and perform the uh, same acts as they're having done on themselves. Um, they may have inappropriate knowledge of sexual concepts. 
they may have torn, stained, or bloody undergarments. They may have a pain, irritation of the genitals, difficulty walking or sitting, uh, pregnancy or sexually transmitted diseases under the age of 14. Uh, they may have actual injuries, again, to their genital area. Uh, frequently unexplained sore throats, uh, yeast infections, urinary tract infections. Uh, they may revert back to regressive behaviors, again, like bedwetting and soiling of their pants, and they may have sleep disorders. Um, as far as child abuse and neglect goes, regardless of the type of abuse, some risk factors that may make a child more prone to be abused uh, is uh, premature birth, um, neonatal separation from the caregiver, a congenital defect that requires, you know, uh, frequent uh, attention and, and um, uh, may consume many of the resources that the uh, parent has. Developmental disability, uh, physical disability, if the child is chronically ill, uh, and multiple births, uh, twins, triplets, those sort of things. Some caregiver risk factors are who is at risk of being an abuser. Uh, it may be that they were abused as a child. Uh, it may be a young parent. Uh, the parent may have history of mental illness or criminal activity, uh, may be under financial stress or unemployed, uh, may suffer from uh, a physical illness, uh, may be under uh, marital stress, may themselves suffer from low self-esteem or depression, and may be a substance abuser. History and physical exam, um, you know, look for those child abuse indicators. Is this a child that uh, potentially is, you know, fits the uh, profile for being abused? Uh, look for head injuries, particularly shaken baby syndrome. Uh, make sure that you document uh, uh, the uh, abuse. And uh, as a mandatory reporter, uh, you are to make a uh, oral report to the Department of Human Services within 24 hours and then follow up with a written report within 48. Now we'll move on to elder abuse and um, some contributing factors uh, as to why a uh, elder person may be abused uh, include the abuser was abused by the elder as a child. So transgenerational violence. Um, people are living longer, uh, but however, uh, may not be able to care for themselves. Uh, so, um, you know, if they're uh, expected to live longer with uh, greater needs, um, they're more likely to be abused if they are a dependent adult. Uh, physical or mental impairments, and certainly the more impairments they have and the more difficult they are to take care of, uh, the uh, more likely the abuse may occur. Um, as the person ages, their ability, again, to uh, help financially with the situation or um, even physically being able to do things like dress themselves or make their meals or those sort of things uh, may put a strain on the caregiver. Uh, they may have limited resources, and so they may financially drain the caregiver. Um, and their caregiver may be, um, you know, under great stress. Types of elder abuse, there's domestic abuse, or what we call community abuse, and this is abuse that occurs in the community. That sort of abuse is reported to the Department of Human Services. Then there's an institutional abuse, and that's abuse that occurs within the walls of the healthcare facility, where you have an employee of that healthcare facility uh, abusing a dependent adult. Um, it also can occur outside the facility when a staff member of the hospital follows the patient on discharge and abuses them either physically or sexually. Uh, in insti institutional abuse, um, that is reported to the Department of Inspection and Appeals because they handle all the institutional abuse reports. Now, probably one of the more common elder abuses that occur is called self-neglect. That's when you have perhaps a dependent adult uh, who is of their right mind and refuses any medical care, uh, even if uh, refusing that medical care may lead to the amputation of a limb, like in the case of a diabetic with poor circulation. 
um, uh, bed sores if they refuse to get out of bed, you know, those sort of things. Uh, but that is, uh, uh, that could be considered self-neglect. Uh, maltreatment, uh, there's a variety of different types of elder abuse. There's a financial exploitation, which is probably number one. Uh, food, medical care, deprivation, neglect, intimidation, physical assault, uh, causing physical injury, and then psychological assault or mental injury. Um, the elder is pretty reluctant, reluctant to report the abuse, much like a child, for many of the same reasons that they fear the abuser, they fear the unknown, they fear being taken out of what environment they have and stuck in a nursing home. Um, they often believe that the elder abuse is not as severe as child abuse. Um, and they, they don't want, uh, they want to protect their uh, caregiver. On assessment, uh, look for that elder person who is malnourished or dehydrated, who has unexplained fractures. Uh, for the um, history given, do understand that, uh, you know, people get uh, brittle bone disease and certainly lifting them uh, from a, a bed to a wheelchair, you can actually break their bones. Um, confinement signs, in other words, have they been tied up or they've got bruises around their wrists or ankles where they've been shackled or tied to a bed or in a wheelchair. Uh, head injuries, do understand, however, that elder patients fall. And uh, falls are the number one cause of death in elder patients. Uh, soft tissue integrity for restraint use. Um, their living environment, uh, the family dynamics, uh, medications that they're on, <clears throat> and whether or not they're being over-medicated in order to uh, keep them calm. Uh, as far as elder abuse as an EMS provider, um, if you see that it is occurring, just like child abuse, it's important to uh, report that. Um, you might be the uh, only person that uh, uh, has an opportunity to see the environment and, and see what's going on as well as examine the patient. Uh, so document it, uh, preserve the scene if you believe it's a crime. Uh, and as a mandatory reporter, um, you are required to support, to report uh, suspected elder abuse um, um, dependent adult elder abuse um, to the Department of Human Services if it's in the community, to the Department of Inspection and Appeals if it's in a facility. Uh, sexual assault um, and rape, uh, sexual um, Explicit conduct uh, is interpersonal violence, which may be consensual. Uh, some may like rough uh, sex, and uh, if, if so, it, it may leave marks. Um, that is not the same thing as rape. Rape is an act of violence. It's non-consensual uh, sexual aggression. Um, so um, don't interchange the terms. Uh, and uh, certainly if the uh, victim is reporting the rape, um, then uh, that's, that's how, you should, um, uh, how you should document it. Uh, make sure the scene is safe. Assess for minor injuries. Uh, document uh, objectively everything that you see. Uh, document in quotes what the patient tells you. Uh, and in transporting the uh, patient who's uh, had been sexually assaulted or raped, um, you know it's important that if possible, same-sex um, EMTs. Um, you know, if it's a woman that's been raped, uh, if you have a female EMT, that would that would be best. Um, prior to transport, you know, encourage them not to shower, douche, bathe, change clothes, that sort of thing, uh, because they may destroy uh, evidence that could identify the rapist. Um, remember that in all of these uh, abuse and assault cases that your first priority is personal safety. Uh, when dealing with this, um, uh, these can be very violent situations, so make certain that if police are not present, that you have police present before uh, entering the scene. Do not be judgmental uh, of the victim uh, or the abuser. Uh, there are uh, certainly circumstances that um, um, 
that are allowing this to happen. Uh, and at this point, it's important to identify it, uh, report it, and uh, hopefully they will get the uh, resources that they need to turn around the situation. Uh, collect and preserve evidence. Uh, follow your scope of practice and your standard of care. Remember that uh, these situations, uh, as in all patient contacts, uh, should be handled with extreme confidence, uh, not breaching confidentiality, uh, particularly if it's a crime. Uh, you know, you know how uh, the publicity, the news, uh, the reports, and anybody that knows you're an ambulance provider and that you were potentially on that call or know something about the call are going to be wanting information. So just be, um, uh, be remember to, um, uh, to treat all information uh, well with confidence. Uh, transport under the implied consent rule, uh, particularly in those situations where the victim may be unresponsive, preserve evidence, uh, and the continuing education, you know, could go both ways. Uh, it's important that as EMS providers, uh, we get education that discusses uh, why abuse occurs uh, and how to recognize it uh, at least once every five years. Uh, and uh, education for the um, the person being abused uh, as well as the abuser. All right, so if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me, and uh, I'll be talking to you soon. Bye.